Big Show. I really don't even need to tell you what day it is. I already said to finish Strong Friday. That means it's Greg Cosell. Although, we're only two weeks away, believe it or not, less than two weeks from the first game, which means we're less than two weeks from being daily, which means Fridays will be Picks Friday, and Thursdays will be Greg Cosell's excellent breakdown. Greg, you look different today. You're in a different place. I'm in the office, uh, Ross, because you know what? It's getting to be football season, and things are looking good, and I'm pretty excited. I've been uh, grinding away watching tape, and well, I did that all summer at home, but uh, it's it's really nice to be back in the office. I bet. So what, let me ask you this, Greg. No preseason games. What have you been spending your time watching for the most part? Well, I spent all summer uh, doing a lot of things, uh, watching a ton of quarterbacks, uh, watching wide receivers, watching running backs, watching certain defenses. I actually spent a lot of time watching college players because a lot of college conferences are not playing. So I think I watched 28 wide receivers in college. I watched 11 quarterbacks, 16 running backs, six tight ends, some edge rushers. So I was home. So I, I you know, I just uh, would wake up every day and pretty much watch tape all day long. Uh, but now we're we're kind of focused on week one, week two, week three, just trying to get back in the groove of really studying hard NFL uh, concepts, tactics, teams, players. So it's that time of year, Ross. It's a good thing. It is. And I want to get into your history, NFL films momentarily. It's going to be a different kind of Cosell's concepts today. One of our great listeners, and we listen to you guys. We listen to our listeners. Interesting concept. Jacob Sprecher. He wants to know how you got started in NFL films. He wants to know a good Ed and Steve Sable story. (laughs) He wants to know the players and coaches that made you fall in love with the game. So we're going to get all to all that momentarily. We're doing a deep dive on, I like to call him the civilian goat. GC is the CG. Anyway, uh, but there's a couple players in the news with injuries that I wanted to ask you about. Because there's still young players that might not be household names for a lot of listeners. It looks like he dodged a bullet in terms of a serious injury. But Bears running back David Montgomery is going to miss some time. And look, you study it more than I do, Greg. I was not overly impressed by what I saw from him last year. What did you see? Well, let's start with the fact that the Bears offense, whoever ends up being the starting quarterback, they need a run game. This is not an offense that can be built around the quarterback being the primary force on a week-to-week basis. So the Bears need a run game. Uh, People can decide what that means in terms of balance and how many carries a lead back would get. That's week-to-week. But Montgomery is a sustaining grinder. That's the kind of runner he is. He's not an explosive big playback. He's a, he's a grinder. He's a competitive, tough inside runner. In an ideal world, Montgomery is the kind of runner that allows your offense to stay on schedule and your offensive play caller to be totally open in what he calls. See, that's the critical piece here. You know how it is, Ross. You get to third and nines too often, and you're limited in what you can call offensively, and the defense has the advantage tactically. When you are in second and fours and third and threes, your playbook is more open, and the defense defense does not have the tactical advantage. So Montgomery is that kind of back. Uh, I don't think he's a great runner by any means, but he's a certain kind of runner, and this offense needs a back. So I want to point something out real quick. Sustaining grinder, not an explosive big play back, that doesn't sound good, but I just want to say something, Greg, and correct me if you think I'm wrong. I think on some level – A guy like Curtis Martin, Emmett Smith, were sustaining grinders. Now, I'm not saying David Montgomery is those. Right. right. I'm not. I just wanted to make the point that calling someone a sustaining grinder. Not a negative. Not you saying that he stinks. No, he's not a negative. He's a certain kind of back. There's always those backs. A bunch of those backs came out in this year's draft. They're viewed as not special because they're not guys who can create the explosive plays that every offense wants. You know, a perfect example of a back like that who came out in this year's draft that was drafted in the third round was Zach Moss, who's now in Buffalo. There's a lot of those kinds of backs. Keyshawn Vaughn in Tampa is another example of that. 
So that's not a negative. Okay. Uh, you know, I got to ask you this quick while we're talking Bears. I saw where the Niners signed Kevin White. Interesting, yeah. Bears top 10 pick. I can't remember the last time he was in the league. We know what he was in college, which was unbelievable, especially that last year, West Virginia. Did you ever see that? Have you ever seen that from him at all in the NFL? Have you ever seen, like, maybe he could do it? Well, he was big and fast. Uh, he was very raw and unrefined in his understanding of how to run routes. And, again, I, I can't remember every detail in the NFL because there was not a large sample size. But when you're talking about big, fast receivers, now with a team and an offense that's very detailed, very well coached, very, very precise in how they go about doing things, this will be his last stop. If, if Kyle Shanahan and that offensive staff can't get anything out of him, you won't see Kevin White again. Let's talk rookie safeties because there were a couple that got injured. Xavier McKinney in New York, Grant Delpit in Cleveland. Delpit's done. McKinney might come back later, but I think both those teams were counting on those guys, Greg, like from week one. Without question. In Cleveland, for sure, because Joe Woods is the D new D coordinator in Cleveland, and he was a D coordinator in Denver, so we kind of know what he is a little bit. He would love to be able to rush for, play really good coverage, a lot of man as well with their corners. Um, he's he's a believer in playing uh, kind of a dime defense, and I think Delpit was going to almost be a slot player in their dime, and Delpit can blitz. And I think they saw Delpit as kind of a multidimensional sub defense player who could do a lot of different things. Now McKinney, he falls into that same category. It's sort of this new breed of kind of multi-positional, multi-dimensional safety who you can play on the back end, you can play them over the slot, they can blitz, they can defend the run. McKinney is this kind of player as well. He had a lot of snaps at Alabama in the box. He you know, he almost has linebacker traits, safety size, but he can also play on the back end. So I think McKinney is also a very big loss because those kinds of players, look, it's the Tyran Matthew kind of player. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't put Delpin and McKinney in that category yet because they have not played in the league. But it's that kind of player, that multi-positional, multi-dimensional player who can do a lot of things. Isaiah Simmons is really that player as well. It's just he's 6'4", 238. Let's get to you now, Greg. I know you don't love talking about yourself, but I don't care. I want to talk about you, and so does Jacob Sprecher. And like I said, we listen to our listeners, especially those that take the time to email me with a sponsor confirmation or just a request, whatever. So I know you played hoops at Amherst. So how do you end up going from hoops at Amherst to NFL films? Well, I was a baseball player and a basketball player. Grew up in Queens in New York. Uh, played high school baseball, high school basketball, played hoops in college. Um, my first year out of college, I actually taught school and coached baseball and basketball outside of Detroit, Michigan. And then uh, this was back in the day, Ross, when you actually sent letters and resumes through the mail. I must have sent a thousand. And one of my roommates came from Philadelphia uh, and his father told me about NFL film. So I said, OK, I've sent a thousand letters. What's a thousand and one? Got a call from uh, Ed Sable uh, telling me that he that they wanted to interview me. Came in for an interview. Got offered a job five six days later at NFL Films. This was in July of 1979. I actually started at NFL Films on July 23rd, 1979, and it was about five years later that Steve Sable walked into my office. I hadn't been here, like I said, five years. Walked into my office and said, "Hey." I've just been bouncing something around in my head about a matchup show. You're the guy. Knock yourself out. See you later. And because that's the way Steve worked. Steve didn't come in and tell you how to do things. He he would come in and he'd just throw an idea out and then say, it's your it's yours now. You, you do whatever you want. You have some fun with it. I'll see you later. And so that was how the matchup show sort of started in 1984. And I kind of at that time had no idea what I was doing. And if I were to look back at some of those early shows, it probably I'd have to shield my eyes. But that's, you know, he just threw it in my lap. It became my baby. And uh, that's that's how kind of the matchup show started. Nothing elaborate, Ross. That that was the way it went. That is an unbelievable story. So, you know, what's interesting? And I've met both men, Ed and Steve Sable. Greg, this is really rare in today's day and age. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say anything negative about either one of those guys. There is nothing negative. I mean, 
Ed uh, kind of moved away from the company a bit. I hadn't been here that long. He moved out to Arizona and he'd show up on occasion and an, an amazing guy, one of the funniest uh, guys you'd ever want to be around. And Steve Sable, uh, most genuine guy you could ever be around and, and an unbelievable boss because what he did is he believed in the people that worked for him and he would basically just talk to you just like I said and and the things I miss most about Steve and I guess he's been gone seven or eight years now is just randomly he would come into your office so sometimes I'd be you know during the season it'd be a Monday or a Tuesday he'd just come into my office sit in the chair across from my desk and just for 20 minutes talk and when he walked out you realize that wow that was an amazing conversation and he, you know, he never came in and said, hey, do this, do that. This is what you need to do. He would just kind of talk. And uh, it was it was amazing. He's the one who encouraged me, quite honestly. Without Steve Sable, I wouldn't be doing anything that's radio based or TV based. He's the one who really encouraged me and said, hey, you're really good at this. You need to be talking about football. Wow. The, the, this is awesome, Greg. Uh, it's funny because, I, as you know, I was at the first ever broadcast boot camp. That's right. I'll never forget, uh, you know, I'm 320 pounds and I'm, <laughs> I'll get into broadcasting or whatever. And I'll never forget Ed Sable came in and they said, and he gave us like a little talk and they said, Ed, do you have any advice? And he said, yeah, I do. Slow down. Right. Everybody talks too fast. Slow down. I thought that was I well, thought that was really, really cool. And those boot camps, as you know, because you've been back for many of them, uh, obviously we missed this year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. But I've been an instructor, as you know, in all 13 of them. And it's one of my favorite things, uh, you know, because I've always believed, just as a quick aside, I, I've always believed that football, a lot of people say it's complicated. I've never believed it's complicated. I've always believed it's detailed. And the goal, just like a coach, the goal of you, I, anybody else who talks football is to take detail and present it in a clear, concise fashion. That's what we're trying to do. So you're a baseball, basketball player, and then basketball in college. But it's pretty clear that – is it fair to say, Greg, like that at some point you fell in love with football? Or do you think you would be the same way if you were doing baseball or basketball stuff? Uh, well, I always thought about – sports the games I played baseball basketball but sports in general in kind of a cerebral way and then when uh, the matchup show started and particularly when we got the coaching tape which I think was 1990 or 91 right around there because I didn't play football when we got the coaching tape and I was able to see the game that way I saw it solely Ross as an intellectual and academic challenge 22 moving parts on every play you know I had to learn the game from the coaching tape and I had the opportunity, I know you said that people want to know sort of the people that I, I had an opportunity to be around and learn from. And probably my the greatest person in that regard was I got to spend a lot of time with Bill Walsh. And Bill Walsh, I probably spent four or five different times with him. The first time we met, we kind of hit it off. And I was doing a piece for NFL Films and the piece was finished. And he said to me, and I couldn't believe it, he said, come on, let's go have lunch. And so Bill Walsh and I go have lunch. And, and of course, I'm just listening. What do I have to say to Bill Walsh? And But he started, that was my education into the quarterback position. And I probably had three or four different sessions with him like that. And that goes back, obviously, many, many years. But he was probably one of the guys that – the guy that really taught me quarterback play, offense, and uh, I read his book in detail, uh, some sections over and over again, Finding the Winning Edge. And Bill Walsh was a great, great influence on how I go about evaluating quarterbacks and offense. You know, it's funny, Greg, because you, you almost look at football like it's chess with real yeah. people. No, I do. I do, because to me, the physical part is just built into the game. That's football. It's physical. You know that, Ross. You played offensive line. It's physical. You got to go hit somebody. Uh, so that that's sort of built into the game. To me, the game is more about the movement of the chess pieces. Is It's the tactical nature of the game. That's what fascinates me now on both sides of the ball. And, and I also was very fortunate. There's a defensive coach who maybe not a lot of people know named Rod Rust, who was a defensive coordinator in the league for a long time, actually began his career in the 60s. He was at North Texas State as a head coach. He coached Joe Green in the 60s. And he, when he retired, he moved to South Jersey and he called me and said, can I come in and watch tape? And for about five or six years, every Monday, he would come in and watch tape with me. And 
I learned so much about defense from Rod Russ. So really Bill Walsh on offense, Rod Rust on defense. And believe me, there's a hundred other people and I, I don't want to leave people out, but it's, it, you know, I just can't name everybody, but I've been so fortunate to be able to, to learn from so many coaches uh, about the game and you're constantly learning. This off season was great for me because coaches were home and I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of coaching friends of mine. And then, you know, we talked for an hour and a half on the phone and I would take I'd scribble notes because I was learning so much. You're always learning, but because to me, the game is a chess match. That's what it is. The physical parts just built in. Greg, this was awesome. This is exactly what I wanted. I'm pretty sure exactly what Jacob Sprecher wanted. Next week, believe it or not, we're going to do a deep dive into opening night. The Chiefs and wow. the Pistons. There's a lot to discuss there. Boy, that sounds good. Greg, thank you so much, as always. All right, Ross, appreciate it. Thanks.